Let's take our Bibles, please, and turn to the book of John. Again, John chapter number six. We're in a, story, uh, in a series now, Journey with Jesus. We'll preach our next message in that series. And uh, I was thinking today, you know, um, preachers have to be focused, especially when they're getting ready to come up to preach. And so I, I have to, I'm one of these guys that. I have graffiti written on the inside of my brain. Sometimes I'll stop and read it and kind of get off track. And Dr. Keene taught me that. And I start pulling down things that I don't need to be paying attention to. And, and, uh, but then again, there's just a lot of things that you know, I'll watch and during the pre-service and listen to, to music. And my wife and I, we pray every week that uh, God would help us worship. You know, the pastor and his wife are... We have a lot of responsibilities on Sunday before and after church and even during church. And uh, so I hope that you come in here asking God to help you worship today. Uh, I have, I have for, for several months now, I've been battling, I don't know why this is, but just right while I'm, uh, during times I'm to preach, it seems like my ears have popped. I don't know what you call that, but I, I can't, like I want to, hold my nose and make them unpop. I feel like I'm about 30,000 feet or whatever you go through when you're in an airplane or going across the big mountain. And uh, I remember as a little boy, um, we would go up on some of those mountains in West Virginia and dad would tell, tell us, he said, you can tell when you're high up because your ears are popping. I remember just a little kid in the back of the car, our ears would pop. We'd say, oh boy, this is cool. We must really be up there, you know. And then coming off the mountain, how it was just such a relief for those ears to, to come unpopped. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? All right, so when I'm speaking, I feel like I'm, I got this head voice going on inside of me and everything's echoing. So I'm not sure if I'm slurring my words or not, but uh, I'm dealing with that today. I was reminded Vance Havner said this, it was written in my Bible. It's not our business to make the message acceptable, but to make it available. So that's what I'm gonna do today, make it available. He goes on to say, we're not to see that they like it, but that they get it. So <laughs> when you go out here today, I hope you get it. And uh, I'm so thankful. Let's stand together, please, read of God's word and ask God to bless us today. I believe the Bible can speak to our hearts just, just in just the, let alone the message. I have some things I feel like God's laid on my heart to say today, but I believe that God can speak to our hearts even and should speak to our hearts even when we're reading the word of God. We'll pick up reading verse number uh, one of chapter six. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him. For himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five bar barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down. In number about 5,000, Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down. And likewise of the fishes as much as they would. And they were, when, they were, and when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together, and 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth that prophet that should come into the world. I'd like to read with me verse number 14. Let's read that out loud together. Verse 14, ready? Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said... This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. I'm going to speak on this subject for a while today as we journey with Jesus, Christ's biggest day of the ministry. Here he had a big day. He was able to reach thousands. 
and food, as was tradition, surrounded that day. And so I want to talk about that. Now, this, this message, this text goes just about everywhere. So I'm going to ask God to keep me on track. There's a lot I think we can learn today. Let's ask God to bless us. Father, thank you for the time we have to look into your word today. Thank you that we have a copy of the scriptures, preserved word of God. And I pray this day that you'll give me your help, please. And the power of thy Holy Spirit, we ask you in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. I don't know what you think, but here's what I believe. Jesus is constantly working. How many believe that? He never sleeps nor slumbers. And the main reason is that he's working is to reveal himself as the Savior of this world. How many believe that Jesus Christ is our Savior? A lot of people do not. Most, in fact, most of the world do not. And so he goes to great lengths to do so. And by the way, he's working right now. Don't ever make a mistake about that. All of his miracles, all of his hours of teaching and preaching were for the sole purpose of getting people to believe in him for salvation. And the same is true today. Everything that God does, the Holy Spirit does today, is for the purpose of getting you to Jesus. If you're already born again, it's for the purpose of drawing you closer to Lord Jesus Christ. And all of us need to do that. Oh, how we need revival. We have before us this morning the great account of the feeding of the 5,000. All four gospel writers tell the same story. This was one of my favorite stories as a child. My mother would tell us this story from time to time. And uh, I always enjoyed hearing uh, about uh, this feeding of the 5,000. It was a big feed for sure. That's what we used to say up in West Virginia. We're going to have a big feed. And it was a big feed, no doubt about it. Scholars say that if you included a wife and just one child with the 5,000 men in this crowd, then uh, there would have been over 15,000. Many believe much more than that. To give you some kind of a picture of the size of this crowd, uh, I I checked this out online. Bridgestone Arena seats approximately 20,000. So if you've ever been inside a Bridgestone Arena, you'll know just about the crowd that Christ was preaching to and this crowd that they were challenged to feed on that day. It had been a long day. There was no place to buy food in the area they were geographically. They had to go to other cities to do so. And the people had had grown hungry. And Christ's reputation uh, was on the line here. The reputation of the disciples was on the line. Are you going to take care of this big crowd? And so as we journey with Jesus in this life, (laughs) there are a few things that we need to know about Christ. And as we enter into this, this message today, I want you to consider three quick things. First of all, we're talking about now this crowd of people there, and there's a need that need to be met. The first thing we consider is this, Christ knows our every need. How many believe that Christ knows your every need? He was very aware they were hungry. This did not catch him by surprise. He didn't drag those people over there in the first place, but nevertheless, he knew that they were going to get hungry. Secondly, we know this about Christ. He alone has the power to meet every need. Not one of those disciples had any clue what was going to happen, nor did they have the power to do that. They had the power of, the, of God to help them, but, but Christ was the only one that could feed those 5,000. And then lastly, I want you to get this. Don't miss this. He desires to meet our need. You came in today, and you have a need of some kind. It may not be that you're hungry. You may get hungry before I'm done, but I'll get hungry, I promise, before you will. And, uh, but nevertheless... Uh, you came in with a need. It may be a physical need, a relationship need, a financial need. It may be just a, a, an emotional need of some type that you're really struggling with. Maybe you're depressed, discouraged, downhearted. But uh, he uh, desires to meet those needs. I, want, I don't want you to miss the fact that Christ wants to meet your every need. At my age, my wife and I would tell you we've had needs on and off in our life. But at this point, right now, at this juncture, we sit here fully sane, as far as I know, unless my wife lost her Sandy in Sunday school. But uh, we sit here, our needs are met. How many can say by order of testimony, my needs have been met? I'm not talking about your wants and desires, your needs have been met. And I'm thankful for that. And uh, let's notice, please, several things. First of all, notice the timing of the feeding of the 5,000. This is very important. The Bible, again, uses a, a phrase after these things. <clears throat> that is, uh, speaking about a, a, a timetable after these things, what was the timing of the feet of the 5,000? If you take all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll begin to understand there's a sequence that's going on here. John does not always detail what some of the other men do detail in sequence. 
And we learn that after these things, pretty much meant after this, this big uh, event that took place, the beheading of John the Baptist. Now, Jesus and John the Baptist, oh, how he loved him and how John the Baptist was the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now John the Baptist is beheaded. He's executed. And the Bible says that when that happened, John's disciples and some of Christ's disciples uh, were around that event. I do not know that they witnessed the event, but they took what happened that day, the headline news that day, and they came back to Jesus. They said, Lord, you need to understand, they beheaded John the Baptist. Now, that was important to Jesus because already the Jews were, were getting up to kill Jesus. They're already making their plots and plans. Well, Jesus probably thought, and by the way, I know he's God, and I know he's man, so if you just kind of bear with me, but Jesus, uh, thinking as a man, was probably thinking, well, now, uh, if they, they killed John, then it's just a matter of time before they kill me, and he knew that. He knew what was going to happen because he's God. And so, this was nevertheless, though, a low time for him to the point that he suggests to the disciples, if you read all the texts in, in the Gospels, he suggests to the disciples, he said, let's just, let's take a break, fellas. Let's, uh, let's get in the ship and go to the other side. Now, I, I continue. So it was, uh, this timing was during a hurtful time. Secondly, it was during a busy time. It was during a busy time. Uh, Mark chapter 6 says this in this account, verse 30, and the apostles gathered themselves together to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said unto them, come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while, for there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. That's what the Bible says, privately. And so it, it, was, a, it was a hurtful time for Christ himself. Uh, he was, you might say, struggling as a man that this person, this other uh, person that was headline in ministry had been slain. A hurtful time. It was a, a very, very uh, busy time. Uh, we understand that Jesus says, let's just take a break for a while. Let's slip over the other side. Now, if you read all the text, you're going to find out that Christ gets on the ship to go to the other side, and the people, the crowd, saw him launch out. They said, where's he going? Let's get to the other side. And we're talking about all these people ran by foot as hard as they could get. I don't know how far they had to run. You can look that up. Just go ahead and Google it. Just don't Google it while I'm preaching. But if you can believe this, they beat him to the other side. So here they are during a busy time, and you might say their vacation gets interrupted. Jesus said uh, that it was a time that, uh, that there was much coming and going, and they didn't even have time to eat. Boy, they had time to eat this day, didn't they? Uh, they didn't have time to eat. Well, the disciples didn't, but they finally did. But when they did, they had a whole basket to enjoy. But I'm just saying, it was a busy time. Now, stick with me. So it was a hurtful time. It was a busy time when this big event took place, Christ's biggest day. It was a fruitful time of ministry. Again, we just read Mark's uh, rendition of this in chapter 6. It was a time when the disciples had been out ministering apart from Christ. And they had come back to report to Jesus Christ of all the things that were happening. So it was a very, very, a very fruitful time, a successful time in ministry. And we'll see in our text, it was during the Passover. Notice that Jesus did not attend the Passover. Uh, there are a lot of reasons for that. They were plotting to kill him and his time had not come yet. So therefore, he wasn't going to walk right into a trap. And so all these things were in play. So we got this big day. We got a feeding of probably 15,000 plus. We got this big day happening. And uh, right, uh, right, in the, right in the middle of a hurtful time, a busy time, a, a stressed out time, a time where they've been very successful, uh, a time when there's another big celebration going on over here in Jerusalem. And you say, dear God, can't you plan these things better? It's kind of like, it's kind of like you're sitting on your front porch and all of a sudden uh, your, your relative shows up in a station wagon with six kids that are brats and they get their suitcases out and they say, we've come to stay for a week. <laughs> Those are the old days when you, you, people didn't have a phone and the car pulls up and everybody unloads and, and you're sitting there saying, Lord, could you not have... Uh, could you not schedule my life just a little bit better? I promise you, he's got your life scheduled just like he wants it. 
You say, well, I don't think I like that. Well, I promise you these disciples didn't think much of it either. And uh, so here they are. Uh, here's what we learned about this. So during hurtful times, Jesus still has the work to do. During hurtful times, Jesus still wants to meet our needs. During busy times, God still has a work to do. Uh, Jesus still wants to work hard at meeting the needs of others. During fruitful, successful times, when you're saying, whoa, boy, man, things are rolling along. Well, God's got some other things that he wants you to do and meet needs. During times of celebration, like the, uh, the, the great Passover, uh, understand that God, Jesus Christ, had some other needs to meet. I'm just saying, God is the great scheduler, and he had, on a time, whenever they needed a break, God plans up to this point his biggest day. His biggest crowd, one of his biggest miracles. And that's just to say this. You are not in control of your life. God's in control of your life. If you're not careful, you're going to miss, a, you're going to miss a, an abundance of opportunities that God wants, that God has planned out in your day because you are on your schedule and your agenda and you'll miss it. By the way, the greatest offenders are moms and dads, and if I can throw me in, a, in a, grandmas and grandpas. Those little kids wanting your time, those little kids wanting to learn, those little kids wanting to spend time. Uh, just yesterday, we had, uh, Joe and his family had a funeral, so we had little uh, Shuggy Bear, and she was there, and and uh, I thought, boy, Saturday I had to have my all, all my day planned out. And uh, in my day, uh, I thought, well, uh, I'm going to do this and this and this and this and this. And uh, Nan will be just fine. She's got her, her, her little granddaughter. Trust me, when Nan's got the grandkids, she's just fine. I mean, a hug and a hamburger is all she needs. She's got the grandkids. And so she'll be fine. And then I thought, well, I, uh, they were going upstairs to play in the playroom. And she said, uh, Paul, Paul, I want you to come up and play too. I said, okay, okay, Paul, Paul, come up and play a little bit. And, uh, but I had to move, I had tracks to make. And she said, Paul, Paul, I want you to play Hungry, Hungry Hippos. And so I got down the floor. If you knew how hard it was for me to get down the floor, getting down the floor is just like falling. I've fallen and can't get up. <laughs> getting up is the big thing. So you, that, that's an art. I actually Googled something the other day. How as an elderly, how does an elderly person get up out of the floor? So there's actually an art to it. You ought to Google it sometime. It works. <laughs> a lot of grunting and groaning. <laughs> you are laughing because you, you know what I'm talking about. And then I got down there and we had a bean bag and I kind of, she, she said, oh, Paul, 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 you, you, you look sick. Well, that's when she gets out her little thing and she puts salve on your face. I'm sorry about that. Salve on your face. And she, she, and she looked at me and she said, oh, Paul, Paul. I just love you so much. <laughs> Two hours later, <laughs> I told my wife, I said, I got to go to Nashville. I got to visit the hospital. And so, uh, again, uh, events that come on your schedule, I'm just saying, you take just the time with family. Now, we, we take a look past that. If God can schedule your time with family and different things, and you can notice it, how, how many would say that there are people that come into your life every day that you could spend a little more time with? Take a little time with. I got to hurry. I didn't mean to spend that much time. I got 15 minutes. You say, does, does church stop at 12? Well, that's what you all think, so I'm going to try to... <laughs> Number two, the testing of the feet of the 5,000. There's a test. In fact, the test is pretty clear. Uh, Andrew says, uh, but, 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 but what are these among so many? And it's just like Jesus said, make them sit down. They were in a classroom. Class had started. One question was asked by the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he says, uh, he says uh, or, or Philip says, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? So the question is asked. Jesus here seeks to prove his servants. These disciples knew they didn't have enough money to buy bread. And even if they did, where would they find someone to bake or prepare that much bread, especially without notice? 
In other texts, they approached Jesus and they said to Jesus in other texts, send him away. Boy, they were, they were just warm-hearted people, weren't they? One, one man said, let them go buy their own food. Yeah, that's great. Boy, that'd be a great church to come to, wouldn't it? We're out of chairs in here. Y'all need to go get you another place. That's how some churches kind of react. May I say that we open up, we open up the bread of life every Sunday here and every Sunday night, and everybody's welcome. When you and I face daily trials, we must remember that in these situations, three things. I want you to jot these down. We're talking about life's trials here. There's needs that need to be met. Number one, Jesus never panics. We do. Jesus always has a purpose. He always has a purpose. And Jesus always has a plan. He says, he said this to them knowing. Look at the text. Um, and when Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw the great company come unto him, he said to Philip, he said, when shall we buy bread that these meet? The question came from Christ. And this, verse 6, he said to prove them, to test them, for he himself knew what he would do. That's the God part. He knew what he was going to do. And so Jesus wanted to teach Philip some things. He said, I'm not shook about this. All these people, you're getting off the boat. You're seeing all these people. Jesus looked at it as a great opportunity. He sat down and taught them. Uh, Matthew said, Luke said that they spent time healing people there. And so uh, the disciples get in a panic. Christ had a purpose. Christ had a plan. And Philip was trying to think his way through this. Jesus wanted to teach Philip, you cannot limit God in anything. Would you write that down somewhere? You will never limit God in anything. Philip thought, well, uh, here's a question. Uh, he said uh, 200 penny worth couldn't, that was like a, a, a half a year's wages, couldn't pay for all of this. What Philip was saying is this. He said, you know, if we could, if we could throw enough money at this thing, Lord, we can feed them. Lord, makes, get, get some money out there. By the way, that's what's happening in America today, amen? With education and politics and health care and crime and drug addiction. Let's throw some money at it. Let's throw some money at it. Let's, listen, ladies and gentlemen, it is America does not have a money problem. America has a spiritual problem. It is a matter of faith. And I'll just say this right now. Getting back to God would cure a whole lot of America's ills. Though I'm not preaching that today. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to understand money is not the answer. Some uh, people have problems in their marriage and they'll throw money, uh, money at it. They'll go on a big vacation or they'll buy uh, the spouse this or buy them that or, or get them this and they'll throw money at it. It's not a money problem. Whenever there's problems, it's a spiritual problem. Some have problems with their children today, and maybe with ch child discipline and all that. They say, well, we'll just throw some money at it. We'll, we'll buy them what they want. We'll take them where they want to go. We'll put them in this college or we'll put them in this. They, they say, well, let's throw some money at it. Ladies and gentlemen, if a child is not where that child needs to be, it's not a money problem. It's a spiritual problem, and Jesus wants to meet that spiritual problem. He wanted these men to have faith. Jesus wants you and I to have faith in him that he can solve our problems. Someday soon, these disciples, Christ will be gone, resurrected to heaven, and uh, ascended to heaven. And, and soon these disciples have to stand on their own two feet. They would see the needs of others, and through the power of God, uh, they, uh, God wants them to meet those needs. And they did that in the book of Acts. We have the recording of, of the disciples after Christ's resurrection. They had that power, and we see the disciples become apostles, eyewitnesses, meeting the needs of the people. May I say the book of Acts continues today, though we do not do the acts of the power and the power of the apostles. We can uh, meet the needs of other people through the help and power of the fullness of the Holy Spirit of God. Do you see the needs of those around you? Do you limit God's ability to use you to meet those needs? Listen now, there are no lost causes. Not as long as we wait on the Lord to come and get us. Uh, are you in the position for God to bless you with his power? Can you get answers to prayer? That's a good question today. 
Can you take the Word of God and open the Word of God and you're familiar enough with the Word of God that you can give answers to people that you're trying to help? Let me just say this. There's power in prayer and the answers are found in the Word of God today. And you and I can help others. But we continue to limit God. You say, well, He doesn't work like He worked in the Bible. Oh, I didn't, never, never saw that written down anywhere. Big days. Big days. Big opportunities are almost always times of growth and testing. Almost always. In my life, when I faced big days or big opportunities, and I knew I was walking into something that was just refreshing, I always knew that in the middle of that, there would be a time of testing. Number three, write this down. The teen of the feet of the 5,000. The Bible calls him a lad. The teen. Andrew reveals that there's a young junior high age boy that brought a lunch. Inside that lunch was barley, five barley cakes, kind of like a little long, like a, like a breadstick, much smaller than you would get at Olive Garden. But it's made of barley, not wheat. Wheat was for the rich people. Barley was for the poor people. So he had five barley loaves. He had two fishes, and they were not big fishes. They, scriptures say the word is used there as a sardine size uh, fish. Look what Andrew says in verse 9. He says, there's a lad here which had five barter loaves and two small fishes. What are they among so many? I sense a little sarcasm in his voice. Philip had already said his point. Well, money, money made his point. Money, money can't solve this, Lord. Well, the Lord never said he was going to solve with money. And... Uh, what they had materially was not going to solve it. And so we see a little sarcasm in the voice of Andrew. In other words, we're stuck, God. Listen to me. God is never stuck. Amen. Amen. Just because you and I can't figure it out doesn't mean God doesn't already have it figured out. Let me say a quick word about the young boy. There's a couple things right here. I'm going to zip through this. First of all, a quick word about the young boy. God uses children. Could you write that down somewhere? I have an entire message I preach on this text about the lad. God uses children. God will use children today on this property. Now, thank God. Children often get adults to the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you, I'll not ask you to raise your hand, but some of you are sitting right here today because a child or a grandchild made you feel like, well, if they can go to church, I should be here too. By the way, I think that's just great that you're here. God uses children and whoever's available, you might say. And you and, I, you and God are always a majority. A quick word about the lunch. It did seem so small. And I think that, that Philip and Andrew were probably speaking for all of us had we been there. But I want to remind you that the rod in the hand of Moses, who was slow of speech, part of the Red Sea, is just a rod. But God used it. One stone in the sling of a hand of a dedicated young lad slew a giant. A small handful of meal and what was left in a little cruise of oil in the widow's house was blessed by Elijah. And the Bible says that the barrel of wheat did not run out and the cruise of oil never run dry. I'm just saying God can take small things like this little lunch and do something with it. You may be, say, you may be saying right now, well, I, just, I just don't have much to offer God. Oh. You and God are a majority. This young boy was there, and at this point, I, I feel a quick need to say a quick word about his, the boy's mother. The Bible doesn't declare that anybody else had a lunch. They just all run across there like a bunch of wild hyenas around through there to see what the next thing Jesus, kind of like a, a circus, a sideshow. Let's get over here. <laughs> they didn't know one planned anything, but... This mother got up that morning. She heard what Jesus was up to. She packed that little boy the, a lunch the best way she knew how <clears throat> because she wanted her little boy to see Jesus. Every mom and dad in this room should want their little children to see Jesus, hear about Jesus. My wife taught her second grade girls today. She taught those girls about Jesus, everybody should want. 
a Sunday school teacher to teach their boys and girls about Jesus. May God bless mothers like this. May God bless those moms and dads that see the importance of getting their child to Christ. You say, well, preacher, he just talks about men in this passage. Maybe this was a promise keepers meeting. Maybe I saw one, one writer said, uh, well, this was the time that all the Jews met with the men. Well, that's not what Matthew thought, and that's not what Mark and Luke thought, because they said that there are women and children there too. So it's a pretty big meeting. This, this man, Jesus, everybody wanted to find out something about Jesus. And so this mother, may God bless mothers like this. Number four, notice please the technique of the feet of the 5,000. I do not know that I can get this right because I was not there and it was a miracle. But I noticed several things here. First of all, I noticed that the technique or the process of the feet of the 5,000 was very orderly. Verse number 10, he said, have the men sat down. I think there's a purpose for that. I think that the men were seated as heads of house or as, as men and then I think their families were seated, or, or, or gathered around. They weren't seated. They were standing so the men would know where to distribute the money. They didn't, or the, the food. They didn't distribute the food to all 15,000. They distributed the food to 5,000. And so they probably come over here to the Smith family and said, well, here, how many you got? Well, I got four. Okay, come over here to, to the uh, Jones family. How many you got? Well, I, we've got three here. Come over here to this family here. How many you got? I got, we got two here. And so so they did it, and, and the Bible says in another text that they sat down in fifties and hundreds. It was very orderly. And if that wasn't enough, God put his special touch on it. Look at the verse here uh, in verse uh, number 10. Now there was much grass in that place. You say, what does that mean, there was much grass in that place? Now, I understand that everybody's modern in here today, but I remember as a little boy, there wasn't nothing like laying down where there's a place of much grass. Now, I'm not talking about Bermuda grass. It's hard to walk in that barefoot. And uh, I'm talking about good, lush, bluegrass. Uh, what, what, well, I can't think the rest of it, but anyway. But, but to lay down in it, we used to play ball, and we'd beat that ball field down to the dirt, and then we we go over in the, in the field has been freshly mown and we lay down in the grass. And I know where well, you got chiggers and ticks and all those things, you know, I get all that, but we didn't worry about that. We, we just, I'm just saying that God made it a comfortable experience. They, there was no chairs there, no lawn chairs. The aluminum lawn chair had not been invented yet. Or the sling chair or the one that has the shock absorbers. How many you thank God for that one? And so he made a wonderful experience, a very, very orderly process, a lot of grass. By the way, let me just say this, they counted. Some of you that can't, cannot get over, how come they all time tell them, well, we had 1,000 or 1,250? I just, it was just numbers oriented. Well, Jesus was numbers oriented. He counted. So let's get over it. Amen? Then we see that Jesus prayed for the meal in verse number 11. He gave thanks for the meal. How many think you ought to pray for your meal? Then here's the process. This is the miracle. Jesus broke the bread, the little sticks, the barley loaves, and he parted the fish, separated them, and then the disciples distributed. Here's where the miracle was. I do not know. I was not there, but something like this. This little boy has a basket. He took his Aunt B red and white checkered cloth off of it, and Jesus reached in, broke it, just started throwing it in them baskets. There's a fish, 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 fish. I don't know exactly how it happened, but it was miraculous. It could have just been, boom, all of a sudden the baskets were full. I don't know exactly how it happened. But how many understand that that's just like the Lord Jesus Christ? Here's my point. It came from the hand of God. How many believe in the unseen hand? God wants to work in our lives in these busy times. The miracle was accomplished by the hand of Jesus Christ. It was the disciples that distributed the bread to the people. That is our job. It was not our job to die on the cross. It was not our job to race in the grave. It's not our job to do the great miracles. It is our job to take the bread of life and distribute that to other people. It's our job to tell the old, old story. And they did that. Then they gathered up. The Bible says they ate till they were full. And uh, even the lad got much more than he brought. Now, again, there's a lot we could say. I got, I'm hurrying now. They ate till they were full. How many of you men especially, how many of you know what it is 
to pat that belly and eat till you're full. That's what they did on five loaves and two fish. The miracle. And so uh, then they turned around and gathered up 12 baskets. This was in the face of those unbelieving disciples. One man said, one commentator said, he probably let them take that basket back home with them. And uh, there was a fragments, just a fr fragments just to, just to re remind them uh, of, uh, uh, of, of their unbelief. I'm just saying when the Lord blesses, he often does so abundantly. While it may not have seemed like much for the people who ate, it was an abundant miracle for their disciples. And it was a life-changing event for that little boy. You and I ought to pray often that God would just do a miracle work here Sunday after Sunday. Our kids need to see a revival. And then lastly, let me give you this and I'm finished. There's a teaching here. The teaching of the feet of the 5,000. What are we to learn from this great miracle? Verse 14. Look at it again, our text. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. The Bible says in verse 2, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. This verse 14 is a, a, a quote from Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 and 18, the idea there that Messiah would come. Now, I'm not saying that all those men got saved. What I am saying is the light was coming on. They ran around that lake just to, just to see the sideshow. Or they ran around that lake hoping that this, this man would, would heal their loved one. Or they ran around that lake to hear him teach what a wonderful thing it would be to teach and preach, hear Jesus teach and preach. But some of them got it. Now, if you and I would look at the big days and the opportunities that God gives us, uh, for me, every Sunday is a big day. But there'll be some that get it. There'll be, be some that believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And by the way, that's what this whole thing is about. That's what this church is about. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that, that should be what you're about, is getting people to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. After they saw the miracle, they began to believe. Ladies and gentlemen, we're here today, and may you came in with a need. I promise you God wants to meet that need. And when he meets it, it'll be a big day. Some of you come in and you're weary, you're tired, you just kind of need a little break. And God will get you one somewhere. I'm still looking for one. But can I say this? God wants you to be busy for him in the middle of all your rush. Don't miss the opportunities God has for you. Let's stand together.